are these people? You ready for our next one, Colin? Sure. Um, okay. So it's more of the same, uh, which we talked about in our last article um, about, you know, this, this condemnation, right? That these, these countries found it important that Russia and them condemn the acts of Hamas, right? Well, um, Craig Murray, you know him, you love him, um, over at Consortium on this one, uh, writes about this condemnation. The political class internationally, with one voice, put out statements supporting Israel's right to self-defense, a right they grant to the oppressor, but deny to the oppressed. So, there have been decades of photos of dead Palestinian women and children and kids being beaten, humiliated, and imprisoned by Israeli soldiers. The historic killing rate in this conflict has been fairly consistent at about 40 to 1. Okay, none of this ever caused more than a raised eyebrow and a mid-tutting from the Western liberal establishment. I can't recall Cameron Cruz ever pursuing any Zionist politicians down the street demanding that they use the word condemn of the latest Israeli atrocity. The uh, paroxysm of hatred and... Although, in, although yes. I will say that changing, but not by mainstream media. No, it's it is happening. Jose Vega did it recently. Um, so the paroxysm of of hated in the political and media class unleashed by a single day of the boot being on the other foot is instructive. It is particularly instructive in the near complete unanimity. What percentage of discussion on broadcast TV or radio have you heard this last forty eight hours given? over to Palestinian or pro-Palestinian voices. A, a commercial came on today for like 60 minutes, all of it, pro-Israeli. Not one single uh, talk of Palestinian like issues, which have been around for decades. Like, this right. is the thing, there's history here. People forget. So, uh, Murray continues, yet it is very plain from social media that the public is by no means as unanimous in their support of Israel as are the political and media class, but the public are not bought and paid for. Asymmetric yep. warfare tends to be vile. Oppressed and colonized people don't have the luxury of lining up soldiers in neatly pressed uniforms and polished boots to face off against the opposing army in an equality of arms. So this is in Boston, Great Great Barrington, Massachusetts, which is near there, right? Um, October 10th, no. I think Savvy was, was over here or close to it. No, um, I think that's what I believe. Yep. With the, when people are occupied, resistance is justified quote, which look out for t-shirts coming soon from us. Um, but a colonized and oppressed people tends given the chance to mirror the atrocities perpetrated on them by their oppressor. That goes with any trauma, by the way. Let's talk about that, boys and girls. Why do you think the children of alcoholics become alcoholics? Why do you think that is? Okay. So this is, of course, feeds in always to the propaganda of the imperialist. A paroxysm of resistance by the oppressed always ends up portrayed by the imperialist as evidence of the bestiality of the colonized people and in itself justifying the civilizing mission of the colonizer. Thus, the Indian mutiny became a Victorian tale of rape and murder of British women and the black hole of Calcutta, right? Thus, the Mau Mau were evil butchers and the IRA were terrorists, which is the modern term of art for those resisting evil and foreign rule. I, I see no lies there, Care Bear. I so, see no lies either. The Israeli ambassador to the UN on Monday described the Hamas fighters as animal-like. This, of course, not true. They are people, but people who have been crazed by unbearable levels of injustice and oppression. I'm extremely sorry for all those who die, as in all wars. I'm even uh, I'm sorry even for the deaths of individual Israeli soldiers, and more so for all the innocents who died and are now dying. But I will not commit condemn Hamas. Uh, this is an editor's note here. Uh, Hamas attacked military bases and soldiers, both legitimate targets, but also targeted civilians which they deny, consortium, uh, which is against international humanitarian law, right? So 
Yeah. Um, I also, little little edit on this paragraph. Every Israeli citizen is also made to do what, Colin? So, oh, they're made to the army. Yes. Yeah, everyone has so. to be in the military to be there, pretty much. Um, so that's part of it. Here we have Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, I guess what they're going to ask him, Colin. Um, let's, <laughs> let's play. Yesterday I sent out a statement calling for a ceasefire, calling for peace. And Again, ceasefire. To the occupation of Palestine, which of course is fundamentally the background to the whole issue. Obviously, all attacks are wrong. But do you do condemn you I Hamas? Point? I think I've made my point. Well, no, you haven't clear. quite made the point. Lots no, of people. Wait a minute. You you love interrupting people when they're when you're when they're trying to answer a question, don't you? Now to say it for the third time, then. Yesterday, I sent out a statement which made it very clear. I wanted peace. I wanted a ceasefire, and I wanted a process which ended the Israeli occupation of Palestine, which is fundamental to it. I don't support any attacks, therefore I criticise them all. And that, I think, is the end of the matter. Thank you. So, yes or no, you condemn these attacks? It's Corbyn. Still trying. This to me is like, you got to say it. It's radical Islamic terrorism. That's, that's exactly what this is. Right. Right? So... Yeah. Um, well, honestly, you know, said... but I think you brought up a good point. The idea of a ceasefire is very misleading because it gives the impression that it's two two sides equal fighting forces going at it, and it's yeah. not the case. No, the oppressed versus the oppressor. Yep. like it's the abused versus the abuser. So mm -hmm. the abuser has to be the one. To get the fuck out, right? Not the, not the abuse, right? It's all. Can't we just so, get along? It's like no, the motherfucker right. hit me. Like <laughs> you know, you know, I'm gonna beat this dude's ass real quick. Hold on. Like anyway, so this is ambassador to Palestine, I think to UK, and uh, hotspot over here is gonna give us some some of this nice bean footage here. So. You just um, condemned Israel for killing civilians, and you won't condemn Hamas for killing civilians. How many times you have interviewed Israeli officials, Louise? Hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. How many times Israel have committed crimes right live on your own cameras? Do you start by asking them to condemn themselves? Have you? You don't. You don't. No, no, I'll answer that question. You don't. You know why I refuse to answer this question? Because I, I refuse the premise of it. Because at the very heart of it is misrepresentation of the whole thing. Because it's the Palestinians that are always expected to condemn themselves. I mean, come on. Right. This is a political conflict. We have been denied our rights for a long time. So this is the wrong starting point. The right starting point is to focus on the root causes. Is to try and get out of this extreme dark tunnel. As opposed to this business and how, by how, BBC how and the mainstream media for, for 75 years. You, get, you bring us here whenever there are Israelis who are killed. Did you bring me here when many Palestinians in the West Bank, more than 200 uh, over the last few months? Do you invite me when there is such Israeli provocations in Jerusalem and elsewhere? Because Israel, what Israelis have seen, which we started by saying tragic, the last 48 hours, the Palestinians see every day for the last 70, uh, 50, 50 years. You Thank know the you. Gaza. You've just described it. This is the biggest open air prison. I mean, it's interesting he said this. Um, actually, I was having a conversation, um, actually, with Nuno uh, online today because uh, we were talking about, actually, funny enough, Cornell West. And he brought up something that made me think of this in terms of you know, Cornell's past statements regarding, you know, uh, this issue because he both sides essentially both sides. Yeah, and, and he's still doing that. Right. And just, um, and Nuno is of Arab descent. Yeah. So he felt, in a way, betrayed by how Dr. West both sides the issue given Dr. West's um, previous Statements, yeah. previous statements on well, that's before he was a politician 
you know, now he's right. a, now he's right. running. So it's like you you got to oh I got to I got to play both sides and I can't piss off be, the people and yada but, yada. But but I thought about it and I actually what I share with you know today what it kind of makes sense for Wes to kind of both sides it in a way. Hear me out and I kind of explain why. Like especially in the church, especially within the black church. This is what I notice. Like and you can kind of argue this kind of stems from slavery. It's the idea of the oppressed almost has to suffer through the abuse. Yeah. It's almost like turn the other cheek, you know, like turn the other cheek, forgive your oppressors, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. it kind of gives the idea well, of this more passive mentality of like, oh, if you just endure this abuse, you'll get your riches in heaven type right. of thing. Yeah, like, when you die. It's not necessarily, right. It's yeah. not necessarily the militant response that someone like Fred Hampton was calling for, right. that's something that Malcolm X was calling for, that's something like um, Kwame Toure was calling for. It's not like... Yeah, there's the, no, there's no the, calls for drums and trumpets to tear down walls. Right. There's no... Which... You know, and let and at look, and I think it's fair to say this for Cornel West. I've not known him to be that. Well, from the evangelical all. perspective, so, it's there's a part of that here, especially with Christian evangelicals, where they want Israelis to keep control of Jerusalem so that Jesus right. can come back and the end times can start. This is right, but it's also part interesting, of it. but it's almost kind of like when the abused or when the oppressed strike back, mm -hmm. like we see this with women all the time, like when women strike back against their abusers, they're often considered the, in the wrong and they get the highest degree of the punishment of scrutiny, versus right. yep. of scrutiny. So, so you can kind of play this out in terms of, I think, really the human condition that the moment that the oppressed strike back it's almost because it oh what the hell are you doing you're not, it's almost like you're not supposed to do that you're right. supposed to just to kind of grin and bear it like you're so, not supposed to do that in public like it's 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 that like you know there's shame right. attached to that which right yeah so, so yeah this guy's going to speak a little bit to it. I know you, you caught a lot of this interview. It's like 22 minutes of gold. Um, but I brought a little bit of it um, that pertains here. Um, the thing is, this is the problem. Israel always victimizes itself. And I have never seen a victim putting their oppressor under siege and bombing them 24-7. Israel wants you to believe that they are the victim. Is, dealing with Israel is so difficult. It's like being in a relationship with a narcissistic psychopath. He fucks you up, and then he makes you think it's your fault. All right, you Bassin. look at Israel as Superman, but they're really homelander. Well, they are like they are, you, you, they are shooting Bassin, fish I want to say in a one barrel, thing. and want... they are annoyed with the splashes. Bassem, I want to say two things. One, if you could just slightly manage your language, we are uncensored. But it's, the thing is, this is the problem. Israel always victimizes itself, and I have never seen a victim put. Yeah. So. I mean, couldn't agree. Um, yeah. So yeah. So basically, what I said, it's the idea of like, um, you know, um, you know, the oppressed strikes back, and then the oppressor is like, "Oh, what the fuck?" And it's like, "Oh," and then they turn into victim mode. It's like, "Oh, yep. look at this person, like what they did to me," when it's the oppressed that should be the one that should have the most tending to. And yeah. so, you know, so right now that's really the Palestinian. Now, you know, as people were saying, it, you know, I can, I don't necessarily agree with the tactics that Hamas did, and I'll just say this here, but I understand it in terms of the oppression that the Palestinians have faced, and they've tried the peaceful route before, and that's what no one talks about. Like, they've yeah, tried I mean, before. They've, 
they've murdered protesters along the fence for protesting. Children. I, like, so, you know, what are I they played, supposed to do? Right. I played a clip of Cry to I think it was last week with Pasta. Yeah. And like, where Kwame Ture asked a person sitting in the audience if you're a slave and I'm the slave owner and the only way to get your, your freedom is by shooting me, would you do it? And I'm sure most of people would say yes. So, yeah, it's just the idea of like, people think that revolutions have to be clean and like there has to be talking and like negotiation like look at this country like america did not get its independence by talking right no. america got independence by bloodshed and that's something that people like that's in our history books but that's seemingly because you know, like the difference is, I think because everyone involved generally was white, that was okay. But to be damned if people who are more melanated actually strike back against their oppressors due to the resources that they're trying to steal from us, then we're the problem. Right. And, but yeah, as I said, I think a lot of people are kind of wising up to that because I think, especially if you are a person of color, you kind of relate to that experience. And I think almost in a way, that's why I think, and I don't want to say, look, I, you know, I have nothing against Jewish people. Like there's a difference between being Jewish and being a Zionist. Let's make that very clear. Um, yeah. like, and, and, they've, and they've locked, they've locked being Jewish to being Israeli somehow, which is not the case either. Right. Which is not the case, which is almost funny to see the struggle yeah. that some Jewish people are kind of making or trying to justify or trying to justify the actions of Israelis when, it, to me, that's not one and the same. No. Like, well, and, you know, and so here's Angela, one, one of your favorites, um, pretty much speaking to the same thing. The yep. Um, <laughs> yep. I feel you on that. You know, all that fucking Afro glow seeped in over time. Don't worry about it. We're working on it. You know, um, How you, you can come back, Angel. It's okay. Confrontation, violence. Oh, is that the question you were asking? Yeah. See, that's, I mean, that's another thing. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence. Um, without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. On the other hand, uh, because of the way this society is organized, because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. If you are a black person and live in, 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 in the black community all your life and walk out on the street every day seeing white policemen surrounding you, I, when I was living in Los Angeles, for instance, long before the situation in L.A. ever occurred, uh, I was constantly stopped. No, the, the, the police didn't know who I, who I was, but I was a black woman. And I had a, had a natural, and, and they, I suppose, thought that I might be a, quote, militant. And when you live under a situation like that constantly, um, uh, and, then, and then you ask me, you know, whether I approve of violence. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, parallels are, are pretty direct here, no? Um, yeah. Guess who, guess who trained those police, Angela? Um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we want to talk about that, which I know some of you, I know some of right. you, and you know I do. Like, I think we just, I think we should do a segment on that. I don't think we've done it explicitly, but um, well, those those people know, you know if I, I get I, top I, position, I, they're I, in I, trouble. I, I, Is all I'm saying? No, but I, I, 
But no, I've said this because I think I said this last week that there been so many people on like on ADOS or FBAs were like, oh, we should have nothing to do with anything that's going on in Palestine that has nothing to do with us. No, but the question and is, as I said, I it, it has plenty to do with you if you're getting beat up by the cops. Because those motherfuckers are being trained by Israelis. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so, uh -huh. so it does direct to you at the end of the day. So you need to be paying Israelis attention. And Brazilians, which guess who's helping the Israelis out right now? Um, you know, I don't know. Some of the fascist, you remember, you remember the fascist groups in Brazil that were there not that long ago? And then supposedly Lula right. fixed all that, but then he's still kind of doing a lot of the same thing. Right. You know, that, that thing. Um, I'm looking at you, Gracie's. Come at me. Like, I know you, I know you got some. I'm more than happy to try that out. Like, you know, um, for this, I do not even, uh, Craig Murray continues, for this, I do not even need to delve into the backstory of Hamas initial sponsoring by Israel to split Fatah and PLO. Uh, they have grown well past that. I do not uh, condemn Hamas because the resistance of the Palestinian people is a reflex response to their slow genocide. Yet it is in what is this word, Craig Murray? In coate? In in cohote? In shot? Like was that French? Um, <laughs> in shawat and violent response. Is this a typo uh, or am I dumb? Like what happened? I th it's probably the I mean, latter. I, but, yeah. Um, of course, of course, I wish it did not harm innocent victims. The people I do condemn are the political class internationally who, with one voice, put out statements supporting Israel's right to self-defense. A right they grant to the oppressor, but deny to the oppressed. Those are the people who need to be condemned. So it, the word is so, in. I think it's in Choit. In Choit. In, in Choit. In, okay. Uh, Rick okay. Sola says yeah. that ain't a word. Well, ain't ain't a word. But a word. we still use that. So I mean, it is a word. It is. <laughs> it's in I love dictionary. using ain't. It's the best. Uh, um, so, so it basically means rudimentary. Uh, gotcha. Or in a law, if you're thinking of it, law, um, anticipating or predatory to a further criminal act. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Just begun and so not fully formed or developed. Gotcha. Um, so, consortium decided to put this little editor's note here. Um, Hamas cannot be condemned in isolation. Israel's ongoing far-reaching targeting of civilians must at the same time be condemned. Hamas's attacks, though legal in that they targeted civilians, which we're going to get to, in fact, you are going to get to in a second, um, must be seen in the context of more than 50 years of internationally recognized occupation routine murder of Palestinian civilians. Armed resistant is legal under occupation. Inter inter intentionally killing civilians is not. Again, we're going to get to that. Uh, Human Rights Watch and UN Reports which have been harsh on Israel's attacks on Gaza in the past, have also correctly condemned Hamas firing rockets toward populated areas, but made it clear these infractions were fewer in number and scope than Israel's. Okay, so this is the UN, right? Though Hamas yeah. attacks on civilians this time were substantially greater than in the past, so too it appears is Israel's response. This is, again, the UN. Um, in this video released on Twitter, Hamas spokesmen deny intentionally targeting civilians things those who died were caught in crossfire. So they're denying that that's what happened. Which, right. you know, one could argue, you know. So that was that article by Craig Murray. And, you know, when you do these sorts of things, uh, the world is unhappy yeah. with you, apparently. So friend of the show, Kate Clarenberg. Um, former ambassador and Assange advocate Craig Murray detained under UK terror laws. We've covered before how they tried to track this guy down, showing up at his house when he wasn't there. Um, mm -hmm. Go check out that. Uh, like the, the Great Escape, or I forget what I called it. Um, something like that, which Craig, Craig was amused by. Um, shout out to you, Craig, if you're watching, which I hope you are, because I'm going to send it to you. 
Um, but uh, on the morning of October 16th, counter-terrorist police in Glasgow Airport detained a journalist, whistleblower, human rights campaigner, and former British diplomat Craig Murray upon his return from Iceland after grilling him intensely about his political beliefs Officers seize Murray's phone and laptop, which Craig, bro, Glasgow, you had Glaswegians grill you? Bro, that's a hard grill. Okay, Glaswegians are a fucking hard accent to deal with, homie, coming from Iceland. Like, that shit's barely English. <laughs> so, fucking, it's, it's, that's rough. Um, Murray, a proud Scottish nationalist, flew back to Glasgow after several days in Reykjavik. Reykjavik. And that that seems like the Scottish spelling of it anyway. Uh, when he attended a popular Palestinian solidarity event and also met with high-ranking representatives of the Assange campaign, which raises awareness about the plight of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Once his travel documents were processed at passport control, the officer informed him he would be detained for questioning, and they led him to a small back room to be grilled by three nameless British counter-terrorist agents Murray told the Grey Zone that British police warned him he would be committing a criminal offense and would be prosecuted if he refused to answer questions. Colin, we just did this story not that long ago called Phantom Parrot. You remember this story? Um, yes, sir. So this is this is what that does. Um, yeah. So this is under Section 7, right, which is their version of the Patriot Act which is why they're wanting Hamas to be ruled terrorist groups. Yes. That so they can do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, um, if you refuse to answer questions answered untruthfully, deliberately withheld information or what Colin refused to provide passcodes for his electronic devices. Okay. Which we know once they get those devices, they download and copy all of the data. Um, right. So, and they don't need a warrant. They don't need any actual suspectic information. Like they don't even have to smell weed. They can just search your vehicle. Okay. So, um, after his phone and laptop were seized for analysis, the interrogation began. First, they grilled me about the private Assange campaign meeting where he told the gray zone. You might think they would ask who was there, but they didn't. He said, adding, my guess is they somehow already knew. Instead, all the questions were financial. Okay. Murray says, according to the former British ambassador, officers wanted to know whether I get money for my contributions to the campaign. If I get paid by WikiLeaks, don't extradite Assange or even Julian's family. The answer each time was no. Murray says, explaining my sources of income and where my money comes from were of particular interest to the officers. The one-time diplomat's po popular personal blog was also of interest to the officers. I wonder why, Colin. Who reportedly demanded Murray tell them whether anyone had access to it or could publish content on the platform and if anyone other than himself authored any of its posts. Okay. Strangely, Murray said he was not asked about a single art article published on the website. Equally puzzling, he remarked were the questions about the Palestine Solidarity event he attended. Officers apparently wanted to know why Murray had attended in the first place. A strange question to ask of someone attending a protest, he told the Gray Zone. Nonetheless, he made it clear that he had gone because he was friends with one of the speakers, a former Icelandic interior minister. Police reportedly also demanded details on the content of various speakers, addresses at the event, information which Murray says he could not offer as he doesn't speak Icelandic. When asked if he planned to attend any similar pro-Palestinian events of Britain, he told them, probably. Um, yeah. Good for you, Craig. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll be there. Um, the weirdest question was, how do I judge whether to share a platform with someone or not, Murray says, adding, I do so based on who's organizing the event. In this particular case, Marie continued, it was the Palestine Solidarity Committee. So I was confident I was in safe hands. Still, it struck the former ambassador as a bizarre line of questioning. My lawyer has never heard of such a question being asked during interrogations before, <laughs> Murray said, adding that 
They speculate police have a surveillance photo of me in the proximity of someone they consider a terrorist. I have no idea who that could be, the outspoken human rights campaign admitted. But as you quickly observed, if you attend a rally where 200,000 people are present, you can't know who everyone is. You know, um, Murray has since consulted with lawyers who informed him that according to Section 7 of the 2000 Terrorism Act, the draconian legislation under which he was subjected to the intensive questioning, he would be legally entitled to consult a lawyer if the interrogation lasted longer than an hour. Guess how long it lasted, Colin? Less than an hour. More than an hour. Less than an hour. Oh, really? Yes. Because they don't want you calling a lawyer. <laughs> because if it did last longer than an hour, they got to tell you. Otherwise, in court, that would be the first thing thrown up. You didn't let him call his lawyer. Like, so, yeah. Fun stuff. Um, thought. Um, I mean, now that you did Phantom Parrot, because I was just yeah, kind of yep. like, what is this? Nice you to know, see that like, pay off, have, right? No, I have to trust you more because it's just the idea of like, <laughs> you know, I just, I think just given, or I feel you kind of do that on purpose to kind of make the connection, not necessarily like in immediately, but down the road. Road. Uh, which yeah. I, like, like, that's my thing uh, is like, hey, pay attention to what they're worried about in the future and like why these are being talked about now. And this is not the first time Phantom 7 has been used. Or Section 7, Phantom Parrot stuff. Phantom Parrot's that specific clause in it that allows them to take the data. So that's my point, is that a lot of people miss that part. Is that if Craig Murray got his no, devices but, but, taken, all his data was stolen. Right, but that, that's... But that's but these are, like, journalists. Like, yeah. that happens just to regular people, you know? Like, it may not even to that full degree, but, like, I've been... Uh, before I got my, um, before I became an American citizen, so I was on green card status, like when I was living in Boston, I swear to you, there was a period of about maybe five years when I was traveling out of the country, um, I would always get the same, uh, immigration officer every single, he didn't remember me for sure, but like, I sure remember his ass and he will always ask me like, all these random questions, like, what were you doing? How long would you be there? Like, do this, not your business. But, like, I mean, I yeah. answered them. But, like, anyone that they kind of suspect, you know, like, they're going to ask you. So. Yeah. Well, that, um, and that's my point so is that if, you're, if you are a journalist and you're planning to travel um, and you need to have a stop in the UK, wipe those phones. Wipe them. Factory reset, baby. Like, I want no data on that phone when you hand it to them. Or your laptop. Or right. whatever. Don't even bring a laptop. What are you doing? Just don't, don't do that. Just bring a phone. Right. Like, you don't need... And this we've talked about this before, about protecting yourself digitally as a journalist. Which, like, mm -hmm. it, you keep those backups somewhere safe and off your main computer and... Don't engage in particular places where you think, you know, like always, always imagine someone is listening and can get the information you're putting out. Just always do that. Like, you know, because they are and they see everything. They're in every email you've sent. They're in every message you've sent, even on those apps that you think you're safe on. They see those too. So the saying. P's and Q's, people. Watch them. Look at them. They're right here. Those P's and Q's, they're right here. Um, but anyway, 